This time, the Planet Mechanics are tackling one of the world's biggest problems, traffic pollution. Their mission is to build an emission-free delivery vehicle for a city centre sandwich shop. But will their solution cut the mustard? Your front tyre fails, your battery's insecure, all your wiring fails. Or will our green engineers be left in a pickle? They don't want to know. Dick Strawbridge is an ex-army officer turned eco-warrior. Jem Stansfield is an inventor with a wild green streak. Whoa! Two men on a mission to fix the world. Whoa! One mechanical solution at a time. Oh. Together, they are the Planet Mechanics. Dick and Jem need to find a mobile base to work from and want to keep their carbon footprint at a minimum. They've come to this scrap heap to collect an old vehicle to recycle. Well, this even got turbo written on the front of it. Dick, this is it. Yes, it's our horse box. I love it. Their plan, to convert this old livestock transporter into an eco workshop. That's if it starts. I've left the keys in it. Here we go. Wait a minute. But uh, practice makes perfect. Give it a chance. Give that it a sounds chance. great. At the moment, this truck is an environmental disaster zone. Yeah, that's not the right colour. It's not very nice either. But once she's been given a thorough green makeover, this horse box will be all set to help clean up Europe. This old nag of a vehicle could have ended up in the slaughterhouse. But now the Planet Mechanics are heading to Dick's farm to give her a new lease of life. It's now officially a workshop. Power. Power. Your house, Dick, you should know where that is. I can find some juice, mate. It'll be green juice as well. Good. Dick generates his own electricity using solar panels, wind turbines, and his pride and joy a homemade water turbine. He spent two years converting a derelict shell into this self-sufficient eco-homestead. Jem and Dig plan to make the most of the elements. They want to be totally environmentally friendly wherever they park up. They're determined to use renewable energy to power their workshop on wheels. The way your hair's moving, Dick, makes me think the wind's doing something right Right, here. well, I, I'll take the wind part, because I actually, I think wind part's great right. fun. Right, I've got the, um, very simple system we're going to use here, right? So we've got a mass sitting on the top of our vehicle, yeah. yeah? And then we've got a, this is called a gin pole. It's on a hinge, yeah? And when we pull the, uh, from the back on the cable, it should just swing upright. Cool. And the top of this will have our turbine. We'll yeah. get into location. The cavalry are here. We will make you green. I'll take the sun. Good. I want to run this by you because right. solar panels are fairly big for the energy you get. So I figure we get like the biggest uh, solar panel we can afford. We stick it on a turntable on the roof so we can clock it round and catch the sun wherever it's going. So it's not relying on my park. Okay, well, so we need the ability. We need to be able to find south because right. we want to have as much sun as possible and we want to get it at the right angle so we have as much sun as possible. So that's a turntable with an up and down thing. Dick and Jem have just one day to get the horse box energy self-sufficient before they hit the road. They want to generate electricity with a wind turbine and a solar panel on the roof. They're fitting a rack of batteries to store the energy, which can be topped up when the truck's on the road, just like a car's battery. So when they park up and start work, they should have all the power they need. Dick's working on the pole that will be used to lever the wind turbine into position on the roof. Ow! That end goes in the hole. Happy go, Jeff. Got a very good day. Good man. The electricity generators are finally in place, but there's much more to do to get their workshop finished. They're going to have to work late into the night to get their horse box ready for action. The 
next morning, and the Planet Mechanics Eco Workshop is up and running. Dick and Jem are in the south of England, on their way to the city of Bath. They're meeting Daniel Blackstone, who needs their help to take on an environmental challenge. Daniel runs a popular sandwich shop in one of Bath's Georgian cobbled back streets. He's doing a roaring trade with his environmentally friendly, locally sourced organic produce. Now he's keen to branch out and deliver takeaway lunches. It'll be great for business, but Daniel is worried it won't be so good for Bath. The last thing eco-minded Daniel wants to do is add more gas-guzzling delivery vehicles to the streets of Bath. This World Heritage site already has a poor record for air pollution. So can the Planet Mechanics build Daniel a prototype vehicle that can deliver sandwiches without leaving a toxic aftertaste? And Dick and Jem are determined not to add to the pollution. Their horse box runs on biodiesel. Biodiesel is a biodegradable, non-toxic fuel producing 60% less carbon dioxide and soot than petroleum-based diesels. Not wanting to add to the congestion problems in the city, Dick and Jem set up shop in a field outside Bath. They're transferring to pedal power to get into the city, but it won't be an easy ride. Right, right foot forward. Yep, here we go. Go. Oh. I can try moving up one there. Yeah. Oh, too much, too much. Sorry, can you get back on there? Yeah, that's right. A lot of traffic. No. I never thought of Bath as having this kind of traffic problem. Yeah, yeah. I really can actually taste it. Thank you. Our dynamic duo have made it to Blackstone's kitchen to find out more about Daniel's plans to deliver takeaway food. Hi, Daniel. Hey. Mate, Dick How are you? Yeah, so you exactly. don't want a big belting diesel delivery vehicle? No, no, no. Right. We want something that's going to be as smart and efficient, but obviously quite sort of green savvy as possible. The obvious thing to do in a city centre is bicycles. Well, yeah. let's Can see. You... I mean, it would be good if they, uh, at the end, if they weren't too puffed out. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to arrive with them sweating. Here's your sandwich, mate. <laughs> Tripping all over yeah. it. Yeah, you know, because I don't want this to be personal. Do you imagine your delivery driver to be like dick size and shape or my size? I'm thinking there's hills. Sounds real. Take. What? No, we are actually cruising for a bit of a. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, that, 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 that's valid. If we just sort of go a couple of miles around the city centre and have yeah. an explore, then we'll get to know the lie of the land. That's the best way. Yeah. That's yeah. the best way. Yeah. There's no time for lunch. There we go. That's a steady one. Dick and Jem have got less than a week to build an emissions-free delivery vehicle, so they better get a move on. What's this? The Planet Mechanics are on a reconnaissance mission to work out what sort of emission-free vehicle would work best given the heavy traffic and steep terrain of Bath. It's all little quaint streets, yeah. built for uh, carts rather than yeah. cars. They're quickly learning that if their eco-friendly delivery vehicle is to stand any chance of traveling across the city center at speed, it should be able to squeeze through the gaps in the dense traffic. It's acceleration and maneuverability then, really. Absolutely. It's also dawning on them that they should build something with a motor. Some of Bart's roads have gradients of up to 10%, and unless the delivery driver is super fit, there could be lots of hungry customers come lunchtime. Right. I can see why he didn't go for the uh, pedal bike delivery then. <laughs> oh. Safely back at the truck, Jem and Dick brainstorm ideas for a lightweight green delivery machine. Right, mate. The requirements. What do we have to do for them? <laughs> right. It's got to have power. We need the speed to get round Bath quick enough so the sandwiches don't get cold. It's got to be zero emissions. Okay. Stick with the Blackstone image. It needs yeah. to be a nippy little vehicle. It's got to be nippy, yeah. What yeah. else? Reliability and safe. Yeah, safe is good. I like safe. Right, with those, give me an idea. Which one? Electric's the obvious. Daniel can go to the shop and buy an electric bike, OK? Yeah. He didn't call us in because he wants us to go to the shop and buy an electric bike. Right, he wants something different. Well, I... Although electricity ticks all the boxes, it's not the innovative answer the Planet Mechanics want to deliver. And a big problem with electric vehicles is that batteries take several hours to charge, which could be very bad for business. Yeah. Give me another one. Air. 
air powered. Why would Daniel possibly want an air powered vehicle? Daniel would love an air powered vehicle. Daniel has built up an almost unique business, okay? Yeah. Now, what better for him than a unique vehicle? That's a great answer as long as it can be made. You know, the power that we get from it, the ability to do the whole journey, you know, two miles up hills, are back you, again, all the Are you thing? questioning the power of air? Yeah. Right. I will make you a bike powered by air that makes you think, oof, check oof. that. All the way up. Jem is determined to convince Dick that air is the way forward. To prove his point, he's setting up an experiment to demonstrate the power of compressed air. He wants to convert this old fire extinguisher into a single piston air motor. Jem has a degree in aeronautical engineering, but his first love is dabbling with crazy ideas. He's been responsible for developing notable scientific breakthroughs, such as the invisible car and underwater houses. And now, Jem has come up with yet another first. The air-powered bike, Catapult. So what are you going to show me? Dick, you know you wanted to see a bike powered by air? Yeah. I've made us a bike powered by air. That looks awfully like a cannon. I'm more than a little excited by it. Yeah. Talk me through what you're doing here. Okay, first You're applying the uh, I'm lubrication. Gre I'm greasing my piston. Lubrication and seal. Just to make a better seal on it's my piston. Seal, so it's a single piston. Yep. Single shot. Single piston engine. All that air. Yep. And it's under pressure. It's going to go down there and push you off the end. Yep. Get on there. You said it's going to work. Oh, Dick. You're not at all scared about this, mate. I'm totally petrified, but, but I don't want to show you. <laughs> okay, it's a dangerous thing? proposition. Yeah. The air in the fire extinguisher has been compressed to eight times normal atmospheric pressure. In other words, the air has been packed into a confined space eight times smaller than it would normally fill. Compressing air is like squashing a spring. The more it's squashed, the harder it wants to push back. Nothing's going to go wrong. Nothing's going to go wrong. You just need to pull really hard. Jem has designed a quick release mechanism that will discharge the air and all that energy instantaneously. Stand well clear. Step away. Right, primed, ready, pressure. I wouldn't put my leg over something like that. Nice knowing you. All right, Dick, if this, if I die, yeah? you will finish the project, won't you? I'll deliver sandwiches on the tandem, mate. I'll put a little box where you were. All right, as long as we're not going <laughs> to let Daniel down. It's the moment of truth, and there's no backing out. When Jem pulls the trigger, the compressed air expands super fast and rushes down the pipe. It's like a mini explosion that sends him shooting off the end. Mate, it's got a bit of power in it. I squealed like a girl. You did. <laughs> But when it comes to Daniel, I don't think we should show him this. Do you not? No, I think he, if he sees us doing this, he may have worries about what he's going to get. I think it shows the power of air, though, doesn't it? I mean, the yeah. stored energy there is tremendous. I don't think I should have a go, really, shouldn't I? <gasps> Do you know the embarrassing thing is if I don't go off the end? You ready? Yes. Here we go! <laughs> the experiment seems to have convinced ex-army man Dick that Air Force could be a high flyer. But they don't want to fire off all that air in one go. That would be impractical and clearly quite dangerous. They need to find a way of safely releasing the air to provide a more controllable and sustained motion. Well, if you think about our bike cannon as being one big piston, okay, what we need is lots of small pistons that then drive a shaft round, just like any other piston motor, except this one's powered by air. So this will be an air motor. Right, we haven't got time to make one of those, so I take it we're going to source it. Yeah. I think we've got to find the right kind of piston air motor from somewhere. Then we need something to store the air that we're going to send to the motor, and fire extinguishers like we used up here are just not going to do the trick. So then we need some kind of air storage, and then we need pipes from there to take the air to the motor. And then we want some kind of drive off that motor, and I figure chain and sprocket's our best bet, down to the back wheel of our vehicle. What's the vehicle, mate? I thought a nippy little two-wheeler would be perfect. So there's the back wheel, and then we come off here like that. There's the uh, front wheel up here, and I need to find us a lightweight moped. 
So they're building a moped powered by fresh air. They'll replace the petrol engine with an air motor and the gas tanks with compressed air cylinders. High pressure pipes will deliver air to the motor and a chain from the motor will drive the back wheel. Jem's idea to use a second-hand scooter is ecologically sound. Not only does it save time constructing a frame, recycling old vehicles is much better for the environment than using new materials. The moped doesn't need a good engine. Just a structurally sound, lightweight frame. After a scooter. Gems in luck. This motorbike shop has just the right model out the back. This is the one. Oh, nice and light. There's nothing to it. That'd be ideal. What do you want for it? Nothing. You can just take that one away. Thank you very much. Take it away. Gems saving another vehicle from the scrap heap. He's a big fan of recycling. Fortunately, he doesn't mind pedal cycling either. That looks like hard work, mate. Yeah, it packed up about 400 yards from the shop. <laughs> okay, what we want to do is we want to turn this into our eco delivery vehicle. Yeah. This is not exactly uh, the come right. Off. That can come off. At the very least, even if we do nothing to the chassis, we should like we should take all this off. <laughs> the moped's frame is ideal. But that old petrol-driven engine and its smog-belching exhaust is the last thing needed on an eco-friendly delivery vehicle. It's got to go. And Colonel Dick is mounting an all-out offensive. His strict regime will knock this bike into shape as a new, clean, green delivery machine run on air. This is the first time either Dick or Jem have built an air-powered vehicle, and Dick is keen to do some homework. To get the lowdown, Dick is traveling to Nice in the south of France. This is no jolly, and Dick hasn't got time to soak in the sun. He's got an appointment at Motor Development International. Guy Negra is heading up a team developing a range of air-powered cars. Guy's air motors are shrouded in industrial secrecy. Bonjour, Monsieur Negri. But son Cyril has agreed to discuss the basics. This is the what we call the mini cats. It's a small car for the town using just compressed air. It's it's very modern. It looks it good. It is, yes. But what's underneath? This is what I'm interested in. The air motor is built into the rear of the base frame or chassis and is powered by these large air tanks. The size of the tanks, yeah. is this what you're expecting to put in a production vehicle? Yes, yes. How many litres is that? Well, uh, this one is uh, 300 litres. That's a lot of air. That's a lot of air, but that's what you need to drive a car in the city. With 300 litres yes. of air, at th how long can this run? Well, uh, this kind of car, which is very light, it's 550 kilo, will run is that all? 140 kilometres in town. How fast does it actually go? This is uh, enough to drive a car up to 110 kilometres per hour. That's fast. Yeah. So can I have a go? Yeah. I can drive one. You can. Here we go. With a push-button start and paddle gears, the Mini Cat is a breeze to drive. <laughs> Air powered. Its super light fiberglass chassis means it's incredibly cheap to run costing less than one euro per hundred kilometers. Absolutely no pollution. In cities where 60% of motorists drive at less than 50 kilometers per hour, it seems like the ideal emission-free vehicle. When the car stops at traffic lights, the motor doesn't use any air at all, unlike petrol engines, which still belch out fumes when idling. This company have been working on the air car for over 14 years. And they plan to put the car on the European market in the next 18 months. It sounds like a tractor. The car's engine doubles up as an air compressor, so when parked up, it can be plugged into a normal electric socket and it will recharge the tanks with fresh air in three and a half hours. The company anticipates the installation of air refilling points next to petrol pumps. This means that when the air runs low, the tanks can be topped up in just three minutes. If we need some more air, what we've got to do is squirt it in there. It's as simple as that. 
dick. Bonjour, Jam. How are you doing, mate? All right, all right. What's the news from France? The air car was fantastic, mate. It really was good. Huge big tanks. We've got massive range. It's, it's impressive. It's nice to have seen somebody's done it before us, but it's very different to what we're building. France has posed a problem for the planet mechanics. The air car is built around three huge air tanks. The moped may be nippy and maneuverable, but it doesn't have much space for air storage. While Dick hightails it back from France, Jem gets on calculating how much air is needed to drive the bike around Bath. Dick. All right, mate, calculation done? I've got good news and bad news. Right, give me good news. Good news is, I think we can do it. Bad news? I reckon we need at least 8,000 litres of air. Yeah. So that's pretty much the same amount of air that's in this room that has to be squeezed into something we can fit on the bike. Right, how are you going to do that? Very high pressure. Diving bottles, they're kept at 300 bar, so that's like 300 times atmospheric pressure. That's dodgy, isn't it? That is the same pressure that you get three kilometres below the sea. When you think about the tyres on this truck, they're what about two atmospheres, yeah, yeah. so it's like 150 times higher pressure than the tyres on our truck. Yeah, but what actually happens if you have a problem with that? Remember, I, safety was one I of our things here. In all honesty, Dick, I cannot even picture it. Because the air must be stored at such high pressures, Dick and Gemma are worried that recreational scuba tanks may not be safe to put on the air bike. To find out more, they decide to simulate what might happen in a road traffic accident by puncturing a gas bottle. Using a full-size scuba tank would be far too risky, so they're using a much smaller gas bottle with lower pressure. They're building a contraption from a pair of giant bolt cutters, which can be triggered to snip the end off at a safe distance. When they tug on the rope trigger, the heavy buckets of sand on the end of the extended levers will pull the arms of the bolt cutter together, slicing through the top of the gas bottle. This is like mouse trap. <laughs> this is going to make that fall, they come together, and off goes the bottle. Yeah. I'll put your helmet on before we do this. I think we're at that sort of stage, aren't we? Yes. We have to walk in a brisk manner over to those rocks to hide before we pull the string, all right? Yeah. That does not mean run. Okay. Time for them to release the safety catch and prime the trigger. Jem and Dick have no idea which way the bottle will fly, so it seems wise to beat a tactical retreat. I don't reckon the bottle will reach the sea. I couldn't be more intrigued. Do you know what? We just got right in the room. I really couldn't. Room. Okay. Right. I think you want the honour of doing it. Yes. Well, that's the Dick, I do. But I'm pretty Stand. curious. Oh. I got full. Here we go. Is the runner happy? Okay. Hold on. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> when the bolt cutter snipped the bottle, it shoots off uncontrollably. It's an uncomfortable display of the potential danger of compressed gas. If the air bike was involved in an accident in the congested city centre, the air canisters could become like projectiles, delivering nothing but chaos to the citizens of Bath. The Planet Mechanics Seaside Stunt is a sober demonstration of the hazards of working with compressed air. The lesson is clear, and Dick has tracked down some high-performance carbon fiber gas cylinders tried and tested in extremely hazardous situations. Oh. Where on earth did you get that? The fire service. This is their breathing apparatus. Yeah, absolutely. They take into burning buildings, things fall on it. It should be safe. What do you reckon? It's a bit small. What? It says nine litres. It's big, but it only contains nine litres. I reckon we need two of these. Other than that, Dick, I think that's perfect. When filled with air at 300 times atmospheric pressure, two of these nine-litre cylinders will hold a total of 5,400 litres of air. It's not nearly as much as Jem wanted, so he's ordered the best air motors he can find. But these motors are normally used in paint stirring machines or commercial food production, not motorbikes. Have you seen inside of these fellas? You've got to have a look at this. There's literally almost nothing to go wrong. That's it. But the actual pistons are going to drive this around? Yeah, so they drive that bearing around yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And that's... Ah, oh, right. It's nice and simple. There are three pistons inside the air motor. 
They work alternately, pushing the central hub around. This hub turns the sprocket on the outside of the motor, which in turn is linked to the back wheel. Now Dick and Jem need to decide where to place the two air motors. Right, right. we're going to line. Oh, quite like that. How does that look? Dreadful. The most obvious place is where the old petrol engine was, but there's not enough ground clearance, and Dick is worried the air motor will soon get damaged. You know, to be fair, this is the most expensive part we've got. Well, how about we chuck it on the back rack? So they'll need to build a new strong rack on the back of the bike to mount their air motors. When we get this done, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? Yeah. There's the bottles, the high-pressure piping, the low-pressure piping. There's the gears, the back brake, the front brake. There's probably a throttle to put on it. There's a new back wheel, because that one's got a crack in it. So we're, we're nearly done. We're going to put a hub gear in, another sprocket. So we're nearly done. I'm sure I'll find <laughs> something to do, Dick. They got a mechanical mountain to climb, and just three days to do it in. Dick starts on the rack for the air motors. Because the air motors have a different power output to the old petrol engine, Jem has to manufacture a whole new set of gearing cogs to power the back wheel. He needs to maximize torque or twisting force. Torque is very handy. For example, when you use a wrench, you apply a force to the handle. This force creates torque on the nut, which turns the nut. For the same pushing force, a longer handle on the wrench gives more torque, making the nut easier to undo. The same principle works for gears. A bigger cog makes it easier to turn the wheel, which will be vital for getting up Bath's hills. Jem's using bicycle components because they're lighter than motorbike parts, but matching up the two is proving tricky. That wasn't exactly easy, Dick. What have you got there that's so, sort of different? Well, that's a BMX rim. Yeah. That hubs for a mountain bike. We've got eight gears in there, so that gives us plenty of ratios. This was hard, trying to get a scooter tire to fit onto a bicycle rim. But we've got brakes, gears, wheels, everything. So as far as I'm concerned, it's actually now a matter of um, getting the wheel on and sticking this, getting this attached. All right. Well, I'll leave you to that, and I'll figure out what we're going to do about mounting bottles on here. Yeah, clear the scary bit. Yeah, the bit that could go bang. The air canisters and motors aren't the only things that need to be mounted on the bike. Dick and Jem have to work out where to put the containers that will hold the food. Hello, mate, lunchtime! Hi, Jim. Daniel has brought a test load. <laughs> but they're not too big. They're the ones that you reckon be the right size. Your... Let's see what lunch is and see if it fits. Bag. All in here. Oh, look at that. You do the neat stuff, don't you? you well, that's perfect. That's just the right amount for one drop. Yeah. So, how are you going to get these to my customers? Oh, you've got to you, you'll this. see this. It's his fault. It's going to be very green. It's going to be oh, very eco. Nothing coming out anywhere clean. That's wow. fuel tank. That's the fuel tank. Wow. You know what it is yet? But the fuel is air. highly compressed air. So ah. it's fresh air being used to drive it. So Blackstone's dinners will be delivered by fresh air. Perfect. It's just what I'd like to see. Yes, yeah. sir. That's um, brilliant. OK, so I can go away and finish the bike, and you will trust us. Thanks I will for, lunch, for now. Mate. I'll leave you with it. Thanks for lunch. Take care. Brilliant, mate. Thanks, Jim. Loaded. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> <Cheers. laughs> it does scare us. Jem's <laughs> working on the mounts for the air tanks. They're coated with carbon fibre, a material that can't be welded. He has to find a way of securely fixing them to the bike. If they fall off, the bike will be unbalanced and could spin out of control. Dick's welding the air motors onto the back of the bike. That rules out this space for both the lunch boxes and the air canisters. That looks solid. It seems the only place left for the cylinders is right between the driver's legs. This way. Realizing his manhood may be at stake, Jem has built some very strong brackets to fasten the air tanks to the bike's frame. Without welds, they're using good old fashioned elbow grease to keep them secure. The experiment on the beach proved the potential dangers of compressed air. So Jem's called in Les Smith, a specialist who supplies high-pressure gas to the chemical industry. Les will fit the high-pressure pipes that will take the air from the canisters to feed the motors. We've got this far, but I just figured without your expertise on the high-pressure side, 
we were just taking too many chances. Okay. So if you can fit all that lot up then, yeah. and I'll get back to working on the chains and sprockets. Yeah. Great. Okay. okay, cheers, Les. The air in the cylinder is at such high pressure that it's vital to ensure that all connections and valves are fitted properly. A leak could turn this innocent looking moped into a mobile death trap. The basic building blocks of the bike are finally in place, but there's an awful lot of fine tuning to do. The bike has to pass a test before it can be driven on the road and Dick's alarmed to find out exactly what this involves. Jim, mate. Yeah. Mate, we've got absolutely masses to do to get this thing street legal. Like what? The mud guard. The radius must not exceed two millimeters. Extremities must be rounded off and guarded. Bottle clamps, tires, wing mirror, rounded edges. We've got light fittings, flat top dip beams, rear tail lights, brake lights, rear reflectors, number plate lights, speedo lights, stands. This is a pretty significant amount of work to do. If we don't actually pass this, we can't deliver Daniel's sandwiches. Maybe don't book the test for any time soon, Dick. Um, That's a big list. The storage cylinders and air motors are mounted, but the bike isn't going anywhere until the chains are on. One chain will link the two motors together, combining their power, and a second chain will take the power from the motors to the back wheel, which will drive the bike. With the chains fitted, it's time to charge up the fuel supply. Charging an electric battery takes hours. I've got to say, I've seen smaller motorbikes, mate. <laughs> But Les's mobile filling station can pump 5,400 litres of air into the bike's two air tanks in just under a minute. That's, that's quite quick. I know we didn't go up to maximum work factor there. The tanks are full, and everything is now set for the air bike's test run. When we lift this up, we're going to have air shooting out of this, and the wheel's going to go around, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Are you clear about yeah, that? Yeah, I'm bloody Yeah. The air motors rattle into action, and it's looking good. Not so bad. Nice break. The brake works. Brake's no safe. That's nice. Nice. Here it goes then, Dick. Oh, Les. <sighs> Mate, look, there you go. You point in the right direction. There's nothing to hit. Yeah? Jem psychs himself up for the bike's maiden voyage. Right, you've, got, you've actually just got air in it. You just go for it, don't you? I am just opening it up. remember? There's a distinct sound of rushing air, but something seriously wrong. Les checks the air supply. It's fully open, but the bike's not responding. Right. That's it. Can I, you twist it again. Can we just make sure you're in, you're in the gear there? Do it for me. Just spin it. Right, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you're in the gear. The air motors are working, but they don't seem to be delivering enough grunt to turn the back wheel. Right, not got it there. They don't want to know. It's a severe body blow, and Dick and Jem look sick. They've only got one day left to get the bike working and street legal before D-Day at Blackstones. The Planet Mechanics are in meltdown. The next morning, and the whole bike has to be stripped down to get to the heart of the problem. And because air power was Jem's idea, he's more than a bit deflated. I'm feeling really worried. We've come a long way, and it, was, it looked fantastic, and it just... I don't know. But if we don't deliver a zero-emission vehicle to Daniel, then we've kind of failed. And, I, and it seems a real shame, because I think something like this could actually work. The team have to pick themselves up and find a solution. Dick's quizzing the manufacturers of the air motors to find out how to maximize efficiency. Right. Okay, we'll try that. Cheers. He's asked Les to fit wider pipes in an attempt to get even more air through to the motors. Meanwhile, Jem's got a hunch that it's not just the air power that's keeping them grounded. It's time to talk talk. We've got a bit of a problem with our torques on this. I can't mean that. Sure, it's all about gears. It is all about gears. It's just that we're kind of limited by the size of the gears that we got. We can't make these any smaller, otherwise the hole is bigger than the, uh, <laughs> than the bit okay. going around the outside. Well, what about the hub gearbox in there? Can we make that bigger? We can't. That's the biggest cog to do. Can we stick another big one on it? So we try and bolt a bigger sprocket 
onto the one that is supposed to go on there. That's that's the way around, isn't it? A bigger sprocket or cog could create more leverage on the center of the wheel. It's just like using a longer spanner to turn a nut. For the same amount of power delivered by the motor, the bike will give more torque or pulling power to not only get going, but hopefully make it up Bath's hills. Jem salvaged a much bigger cog from the moped's old back wheel. And there's still no guarantee it'll work though. Dick. Yo, how are we doing mate? I think that's the new system put together. So we've got the new gearing on the chain. Yeah. We've got the shorter pipes. We've got the fatter pipes. More curvy as well, yeah? Yeah. So I fitted the front sprocket off the bike onto here yeah. and the rear sprocket onto here, which gives us just on gearing alone three times as much torque. So have the changes made the difference? This could be the Planet Mechanic's last chance. I've got a sneaking feeling we've invented the first air-powered motorbike. I actually think this is going to work. I want to see it. Go, go for it. <sighs> right. Can I just say... If I go over the back you know end, Vic, it's still a thing of beauty. It's amazing. You ready? <laughs> we can oh, feel oh, it. It wants oh, to go. It wants oh, to go. It wants movement. to go. Yes! <laughs> What a difference a day makes. The Planet Mechanics have built an extraordinary vehicle powered purely by fresh air. Oh, that's a bit of a that's smoothie. That's just ace. That is brilliant. brilliant. That is brilliant. Go on, Dick. Off you, on you go, on you go, on you go. <laughs> now for the real test. Chain, Has yeah. it got enough oomph to shift Dick? Forward a little bit. We might have to raise that seat. Right. Oh, yes! <laughs> Slightly more sedate with me on it! Finally, they're on a roll, but this is no time for joyriding. Rebuilding the bike has put them way behind schedule. The bike has to be tested at the vehicle inspection center before they can do the lunchtime delivery for Blackstones tomorrow. So, will the vehicle pass the test, or will a red-faced Dick and Jem have to run around Bath delivering sandwiches on foot?